Well, welcome. I'm, I'm delighted and honored to, to, to welcome a very distinguished uh, visitor, uh, Professor Timothy Garton Nash. Uh, Professor Garton Nash is Isaiah Berlin Professorial Fellow at St. Anthony's College, uh, Oxford, and a Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, Stanford University. He has published widely on, on the revolutions in 1989 in, in Central and Eastern Europe, on German history, on uh, European integration. Uh, but what I particularly value about Professor Gatonage is that he's not just an academic, he is a very engaged public intellectual. So he publishes essays in the New York Review of Books, he publishes opinion pieces in The Guardian, and across Europe. So when I travel to Poland, Slovakia, I can read uh, uh, Professor Gatonage's contributions in, in, in a number of languages, in Germany too. So I'm very, very honored and, and uh, pleased to welcome you here. And this is um, a contribution to our subject called Europe uh, Without Borders. I would like to start by asking you about the legacy of 1989. You were a participant observer in these revolutions. 30 years later, you just presented reflections on the hopes of 1989 in Belgrade, as it happened in, in Serbia. And the title of your question was, Where we stupid? Why? So, the first thing to say is that 1989 was arguably the best year in European history. For people who don't remember it, uh, you have to realize that the Iron Curtain and the Berlin Wall seem to those who live behind it like a fact of physical geography. It was like the Alps, and it had behind it a nuclear-armed superpower. And what happened in the Velvet Revolutions, culminating in the fall of the Berlin Wall, was like the Alps collapsing in front of our eyes. Um, a nuclear-armed superpower uh, and its empire softly and suddenly crumbled away with hardly a shot fired in anger. So it was one of the best moments in European history, and it started a transition to democracy, free market economies, and so on, in the other half of Europe and to the biggest unification of Europe we've ever had by peaceful means. So it was a great moment. Now, 10 years on, 1999, even 20 years on, 2009, we were still celebrating this extraordinary achievement and, and the fact that the new democracies of East Central Europe had gone on to become members of the European Union and NATO. 30 years on, the picture looks very different. Uh, you have uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary dismantling liberal democracy. I would argue Hungary is no longer a liberal democracy. You have Jaroslav Kaczynski in Poland trying to follow his example, urbanization a la Polonaise. You have strong nationalist populist movements across the continent of Europe, not just in Central and Eastern Europe. And the question is why were there great mistakes we made back then? For example, in believing too much in the power of the market, of free market economics. For example, in believing too much in knocking down frontiers, mm. in having a cosmopolitan, open Europe uh, without the familiar community of a nation state um, that, that led to the problems we have today. That, that's a question to which we then have to give a, a nuanced answer. One of the concepts that animated debates amongst dissident intellectuals before 89 and after uh, was the concept of Central Europe. And, and, and the slogan of the revolutions was a return uh, to Europe. So in that way, it seemed obvious that the nations of Central Europe wanted to reclaim their European destiny, right? So, so what it went was on? absolutely the central strategic direction of 1989. Um, I remember a... Uh, a Samizdat, an underground magazine, had a sort of uh, humorous political dictionary. And the entry under Europe in the mid-1980s read, if we go into a restaurant and there's a clean tablecloth and they actually have the food that is on the menu and a waiter appears in less than 20 minutes, we say Europe. <laughs> so Europe stood for everything. It stood for peace, freedom, democracy, prosperity, the rule of law, modernity. That was the dream, and the slogan was a return to Europe. And the idea of Central Europe, about which I wrote a lot at the time, was 
in, in Hungarian literature, there's the idea of a fairy country. Like here in Hong Kong, you have the ferry from Hong Kong Island to Kowloon. And the idea of Central Europe was to be the ferry that took you from Soviet-dominated Eastern Europe to the dreamed of Western Europe. That's what Central Europe was to be. Um, the problem, of course, began when the new democracies of Central and Eastern Europe arrived in Europe, in liberal democracy and the market economy. And of course, the reality never lives up to the dream. And that is what happened in a way, right, with the enlargement of the European Union 15 years after the collapse of communism, 2004, Europe was uh, one and united, and a Europe without borders emerged. But as you already pointed out, that also created a number of problems that we are dealing with now. So the question is, did the leaders in the West underestimate the forces of nationalism? And did those dissident intellectuals and the leaders of the nonviolent revolution of 1989 underestimate uh, the forces of national attachment. So let me go back a little fast because it's very easy from 30 years on. Hindsight is 2020, yeah. and it's very easy to identify all the faults. But think back to the Magic Lantern Theater in Prague. Here were my friends, the dissidents, Václav Havel and his colleagues. Um, intellectuals, playwrights, novelists, philosophers, still in their cardigans, uh, chain smoking, smoking, who had absolutely no experience with economics or government or anything of that kind. And suddenly, miraculously, within a few weeks, they were going to be running the country. Imagine that. And you had a pretty much ruined economy centrally planned economy, no rule of law, very few independent institutions, because these had been totalitarian systems, um, very little real civil society in the true sense, that is to say, society that is economically independent of the state. And the joke at the time was, we know that you can turn an aquarium into fish soup, that's what totalitarianism did, yes can we turn a fish soup back into an aquarium? Now, measured against that starting point, what was achieved in those first 15 years up to the entry into the EU in 2004 was incredible. It exceeded our wildest hopes. We did succeed in turning it back into something like an aquarium, a halfway functioning market economy, something like a liberal democracy, some elements of the rule of law and civil society. So that's important to say. My argument is that, that, that where we began to be hubristic and have a kind of liberal overreach was in the moment of triumph in around 2004, mm -hmm. when we believed that everything could just carry on going so well and getting better, and did not realize a couple of things. Number one, that the transition to a free market economy in the circumstances of the financialized globalization of capitalism, some would say neoliberalism, had left a lot of people in these societies feeling left behind. If you went to a small town in southeastern Poland, or in eastern you Slovakia, could see, or in eastern Slovakia, it was a very different picture from the shiny new facades of, uh, of Prague or of Warsaw. Um, that point number one. Point number two, imagine you're 40 years old and suddenly everything you have ever known is changed. The street signs, what's in the shops, the political system, the economic system, the way you have to work, and suddenly the borders have gone and people are flowing to and fro and West European secularism and liberalism and modern lifestyle and multiculturalism, all of this is happening all at once. I mean, it's a, a revolutionary change. And understandably, a lot of people, for a lot of people, it was just too much, too fast, too much change. And so people reached back to the familiar, the well-known community and identity, family, church, nation. Mm 
And that's, I think, what we underestimated. My good friend, the brilliant French analyst, Pierre Asnard, put it presciently when he said, as we celebrate the victory of universality and liberty, let us not forget the old yearnings that gave us socialism and nationalism, the yearning for solidarity and equality on the one hand, and for community and identity on the other. And I think we liberal internationalists, pro-Europeans, somewhat neglected those two great yearnings. My question, I, I, I wonder whether that moment of hubris, uh, at least in, in, in Western Europe, occurred much earlier. I mentioned Eastern Slovakia because I'm originally from Eastern right. Slovakia. Right. But in 1989, I lived uh, in what was then West Germany. And so I, I watched and, and witnessed the, the process that led to, to German unification. And it was alongside uh, the process of German unification that the push towards the European unity was greatly intensified. So it goes back to 1989 that we have the Treaty of Maastricht that created the European Union, a euro without borders, also the single European currency. So was that moment of hubris too fast, too far in relation to the European project? Uh, uh, did it occur already then, 1989, uh, so, uh, 1990? So that's, that's an, a, an excellent point, but I think it's a, a slightly different story because what I've been talking about so far is in the logic of a certain kind of liberalism. Yeah. Um, what happened in relation to European monetary union, which is a crucial point, um, was something quite specific, um, which is this. There was already in the 1980s a project of a European monetary union to complement the single market. There was an economic logic to yeah. that. But when the Berlin Wall came down, it wasn't just Margaret Thatcher who panicked at the prospect of a united mm -hmm. Germany. It was also the French president, François Mitterrand, and the Italian prime minister, Giulio Andriotti. Margaret Thatcher foolishly tried to stop it. You advised her at some moment. I right? did, and I advised her not to try to stop it. <laughs> I mean, I was very much... I was a group of historians who was asked to advise her in March 1990. I've never forgotten the, a whole day-long seminar at her country house of Chequers. And um, all of us, very different historians, said, you must seize this opportunity of having a united Germany that's part of the West. But Mitterrand and Andriotti took a different course. They said, dear Helmut Kohl, we will support you in this, but we have a price. And our price is that you commit firmly to a timetable for European monetary union uh, so that United Germany will be bound in to a more integrated Europe, which Kohl anyway wanted. His slogan was, we want a European Germany rather than uh, a German uh, Europe. A German so, Europe, of course, right, in uh, effect, we got both. But that's another story. <laughs> but related to this. Uh, closely related to this. Um, one other way to put it was put on the golden handcuffs, the golden handcuffs of European integration. But the problem was that the means chosen to this end was monetary union. And that meant that from the outset, the monetary union was deeply, deeply flawed in its design in two ways. First of all, you had a monetary union without a fiscal union a currency without a treasury. And we know from history, economists said at the time, I warned against it too, that's not going to work. Secondly, because it was an eminently political project, rather than the original economic one, uh, the decision about which countries would be part of it was taken on political reasons. So Italy, although it did not qualify according to the criteria for national debt and budget deficit had to be part of it because it was a founding member of the European Union. And then Spain had to be, and then Portugal had to be, and finally Greece, Greece because how could we exclude the, the cradle of Western democracy from this core European project? So you got a monetary union which not only had this crucial flaw of having common currency without common treasury, but had far too diverse economies. And this has been a cancer to this day, eating away at the heart of European unity. 
because in addition to the old divide, very familiar to you mm -hmm. coming from East Central Europe, between Western and Eastern Europe, you have a big new divide that's opened up between Northern and Southern Europe. So that's, that's one of the key drivers of what I would now say 30 years on is a period of European disintegration rather than integration. But so for me, the connection is still there between the challenge that we face in terms of um, giving enough space to a kind of liberal nationalism and, and the reality of a single European currency. So going back to Margaret Thatcher, we can both agree that she was wrong in attempting to stop somehow the process of German unification. But she, she was proven right in uh, attempting to stop uh, uh, that further step towards European unity. She was vehemently opposed against the single European currency. And that, that uh, argument, uh, I, I think, uh, proved correct, right? There are many conservative observers who, who argued that the extent of political unity required for the single European currency to work is just not going to be deliverable. And the euro remains a currency in search of a state. And the question is whether Europeans can ever attain that level of unity. So there's the question of national identity. So, so I think relates. there's a a specific and a general point. Yes. A specific point is that for Germany, for Helmut Kohl, at that moment after the wall came down, um, accepting monetary union was an economic means to a larger political end, which was to achieve first German unification and then European unification. Um, so the monetary union was a means to the political end. The irony now is it is precisely the reverse. And the way the monetary union is, is dysfunctional is pushing towards a closer political union, fiscal and political union, which the majority of Germans and most other Europeans no longer want. Mm. So the logic has been completely reversed. And that's a specific point about Germany. But the majority of, of people in Europe never wanted that extent, arguably, well, of, of Europe. Well, if European you had unity. asked most Germans in 1989, they would have said yes to European Union. Um, but no to single European currency. Well, they didn't want to give up the Deutschmark. But, you know, I wrote a, a history of German Ostpolitik, which is called In Europe's Name. And the basic argument was. European construction has depended to a huge degree on this extraordinary commitment of West Germany to European integration. Why was West Germany so committed to it? For two reasons, idealistic and instrumental. The idealistic reason was that having created the greatest disaster in modern European history, namely Nazism, the Third Reich, and the Second World War, they wanted to make up for it, right, put rather crudely. The instrumental reason was only by regaining the trust and confidence of your European neighbors could you make your way to the national goal of German unification. Mission accomplished, German unification achieved, the question posed was, what remains of German Europeanism? Mm. And the answer 30 years later is we now have a much more realistic, much more pragmatic, uh, German Europeanism, which is much closer to that of other European countries, as to say, quite calmly pursuing its national interest while being broadly pro-European. So my point is, the project was right for, so to speak, the state of consciousness in Germany and to some extent in France and Benelux back in 1989, but that state of consciousness no longer prevails. Now, your larger point, I completely agree with to this extent. We will not have a United States of Europe in any foreseeable future. The people of Europe are not ready for that. One of the greatest Europeans of our time, Bronisław Geremek, mm. the former Polish foreign minister, a remarkable figure, a historian said it to me, a historian, a great medievalist, a historian, a survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto, a hero of the Solidarity Movement in Poland. I remember him saying to me, after the French and Dutch referendums rejecting the European Constitution, Bonarodito Niexon, the peoples don't want it. Mm. And so one has to recognize that fact, that in that sense, we went too far. 
that does not mean that there isn't a very coherent project for a European Union, but it's a slightly different kind of European Union, which keeps the nation states as the main loci of democracy, but has very strong European institutions, which, for example, has a much stronger common foreign and security policy. Because we're sitting here in Hong Kong, and if you ask yourself, why do we need, we Europeans need a European Union in the 21st century, then the clearest one-word answer is China. Faced with the emergence of these great non-Western, non-European superpowers to defend our own interests, our European values, our European way of life, we need the scale that only Europe gives. So the challenge is to achieve that scale without trampling roughshod over the democratic sensibilities of members of individual European nations. And so that takes us back to, to the initial point you, you, you made, that perhaps that the importance of national attachments was, was uh, not fully recognized, uh, right? And, and recently you advocated uh, that we should uh, reclaim the language of, of what you called liberal patriotism. Yeah. I, I call it liberal nationalism. The question, though, is, is that enough? Uh, uh, you know, would you accept that at least some segments in, in British society advocating the UK's departure from the EU did it because they believe that that is the only way to reclaim control over their destiny, to, to reclaim democratic self-governance? So, first of all, the point about liberal patriotism and by the way, I use the term patriotism as opposed to nationalism stipulatively. So I stipulate the meaning that by patriotism I mean a positive, constructive love of country. Yes. By nationalism I mean a negative, aggressive attitude to other countries. Which incidentally is, is the meaning of that very word in most continental languages. So the right. very so, concept of liberal nationalism wouldn't work in German, so, so in I, Slovak. I have, uh, in, 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 as a historian of East Central Europe, I know all about 1848 and liberal nationalism. Yeah. So I have no problem with it analytically. I yeah. just think it's useful to use that stipulative distinction. Now, one of the mistakes that liberals made particularly in post-communist Europe, but also elsewhere, was just to talk all the time about globalism, internationalism, cosmopolitanism, Europeanism, and leave the nation, the subject of the nation, to the populist right wing and the real nationalists and xenophobes. Uh, whereas we should have developed a liberal notion of, of the nation, a civic patriotism, one in which everyone who is a citizen of the country and subscribes to the law and values of that country is a full member of the nation, not an ethnic definition of it. So I, I think that is absolutely what we need now. We need more liberal patriotism in that sense. I do not see that as being incompatible with having a strong European Union. To your question about Brexit, the brilliant slogan of the Leave campaign was take back control. That is so brilliant because it captures everything that people who felt left behind, ignored, neglected uh, felt. We want to take back control of, 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 of our own destinies and the argument from democratic self-government is amongst the most respectable arguments for Brexit. It has two problems at least. Number one, which nation are we talking about? Because Britain is a country made up of four nationalities and the Scots are now crying blue murder. They're saying, we voted to stay in the European Union. You English are dragging us out against our will, right? So there's a question of national self-determination which is posed there which could result in the breakup of the, of the United Kingdom. Secondly, I think it's actually wrong to suggest that our politics were being dictated by Brussels, by some foreign power, because you know very well that the key decisions in the European Union were mainly taken by national representatives working through the councils of ministers. Yeah, so the argument about being dictated would be more applicable to 
to countries on the periphery of the eurozone like like uh, Greece. Uh, Absolutely. So where uh, Absolutely. where 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 that uh, the tough rule of of euro was certainly. So this is an uh, important felt, uh, point because we were talking about liberalism mm-hmm. and democracy. Um, the the analyst of populism, Cass Müller, said uh, uh, um, that that populism is a kind of um, claim for illiberal democracy faced with undemocratic liberalism. And the EU is certainly vulnerable to the charge of undemocratic liberalism. When a Greece or even an Italy has a democratically elected government which goes up against the austerity policy Mm. of the Eurozone, and the Eurozone says, no, 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 you've got not only to change your policy, you've got to change your prime minister. That feels like undemocratic liberalism. Mm. The irony of the British position is we had opt-outs from most of those (laughs) things, so we were the people who suffered from it least. So there there are scholars who talk about an authoritarian turn in in EU politics in relation to to this uh, Eurozone uh, governance or or the Eurozone crisis. But I I want to push you a bit more on on the appropriate scale of of political organization. There are few scholars uh, in Britain or outside of Britain who are sympathetic towards Brexit, but there is a very prominent German sociologist who is looking at, at uh, uh, European integration from a left-wing perspective, Wolfgang Streck, and he yeah. grew increasingly skeptical towards uh, what he sees as centralizing tendencies within the EU. So he seems sympathetic towards the claim of uh, reclaiming control. And in a recent essay, he, he, he argued that one of the key questions of our, of our day is, what is better for a political society, to be big or to be small, and better on what respect, how best to draw the borders between states that separate domestic from international political structures. So, there's no abstract answer to that question, because the United States of America is a huge country with well over 300 million people who clearly feel that they are one political community, who clearly belong together. So the notion which you find all the way back to Montesquieu and Tocqueville, um, that large countries have more difficulty with democracy, has to be qualified by that statement. I mean, it's 350 million people. But what is clear is that to have democracy, representative government, which is really felt to be representative, you have to have what John Stuart Mill called a unified public opinion. And that is very difficult to have when you don't speak the same language. And since language is the defining feature of European nationhood, we are uh, in the very nature of our being, of our cultures, uh, there is an inbuilt constraint on the extent to which we can have a genuinely unified public opinion, much as I support all all attempts. You mentioned my different commentaries. How do I reach a wider European audience? Mm -hmm. Not by just writing in English on some online website. That meets a tiny, tiny group of people by having these articles appear in 10, 15 different languages. That's the only way to do it. So I think realistically one has to recognize that constraint and say, therefore, the European Union is not going to be like a traditional state. It's going to be, someone said, an unidentified flying object, a commonwealth. And we're creating a unique kind of polity um, where it's a kind of indirect democracy that is being practiced, delegated authority through the councils of ministers. What would you say to people who argue that the UK departure might actually help Europe in achieving that level of unity that is necessitated by the project of the single European currency? I mean, what what, uh, to me seems to become ever more apparent is that uh, we, we know, I mean, it's something of a cliche to say that the UK was always an an uneasy and uncomfortable member in, in the EU for, for, for a number of the historical uh, uh, reasons, but that is becoming even more apparent, right? That the UK system of governance, its uh, uh, attachment to the sovereignty of uh, the House of Commons and 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 uh, to its uh, 
the, the common law system, right, that we have in Hong Kong, it differs in many significant ways from the way in which European societies are governed. So if Europe needs more unity, which I don't believe is the case, but as we are told by, by economists and many political scientists who say that to fix the problems of the Eurozone, to fix the problems of migration, uh, continental Europe will need to achieve more unity. It might be uh, closer to that aim without the UK in it. So do you really think that France has more in common with Ukraine and Greece than France has in common with Britain? Do you seriously believe that? No. No. <laughs> well, you've answered your own question. <laughs> it is a, a really... And it's fascinating how this narrative is now becoming established. Mm. The French philosopher Henri Bergson talks about the illusions of retrospective determinism, the almost irresistible temptation to think that what has happened somehow had to happen. So now everybody is rewriting history as if Brexit was inevitable yes. because the Brits are so different. Uh, the very Austrian writer Robert Manas wrote, Britain was never really a member of the European Union. It's complete nonsense. If it had been 52%, 48% the other way, we would now have a completely different narrative. Remove Britain and Europe remains an incredibly diverse continent with very different political cultures and traditions. Even between even, France and Germany. Well, I was about to say, okay. even if we think of core Europe as being what it has really for so long been, Carolingian Europe, mm. roughly speaking, the territory of Charlemagne's former empire. Look at the fundamental difference exposed by Emmanuel Macron's letter to the citizens of Europe and the Christian, German Christian Democrat leader Annegret kramp karrenbauers response. Um, actually, I think that many people have, how shall I put it, to some extent been comfortably hiding behind British contrariness. Many North European countries were very happy, happy to, for Britain to be the blocking power, and they sat quietly there being good Europeans, but actually agreeing. Now you already see something called the Hanseatic League emerging within the Eurozone and the EU. So I do not believe for a moment that the departure of Britain is going to be good for European integration. On the contrary, I think it will be a catalyst. I fear I fear it will be a catalyst of further European disintegration. Well, and that leads to my very last question, and that is, you know, can, can the EU survive and thrive? And, and if yes, how? So, um, as a historian, I have to start with the following observation. Throughout European history, across the centuries, we have had European orders being constituted, empires, commonwealths, entente alliances. They have lasted a certain period of time, normally decades, and then gradually they have disintegrated. So that is a pattern throughout European history. And there is no good reason to believe that the European Union will necessarily be any different, right? So that if the question is about the centuries, then one would expect as a historian that they would, with time, disintegrate. Um, the question then becomes, should we try to hang on to what we have to defend the achievements of the European Union? And let me say that with all its faults, this is the best Europe we've ever had. I point me to it a better one in history to try and defend our achievements, to have a kind of small-c conservatism about what has been achieved in the European Union, or to take the gamble of letting it go, the gamble being that what emerged afterwards would be worse, would, would be better. I don't believe that for a moment. So I think that while, as a historian, I can see the process of disintegrating continuing, as a spectator engagé, as a European, I want to try to preserve the achievements of the European Union. How do we do that? By cautious, pragmatic reform. Recognizing that the last thing Europe needs at the moment is another grand design, another great projet, 
another great leap forward to the United States of Europe. On the uh, No, it needs pragmatic, realistic reform to try and preserve what we have achieved and meet the real concerns of people all over Europe. Thank you, Professor Gatton. Now we have a few students in, in the audience and I'm very keen uh, to get them engaged in our conversation. So now is the time for, for your questions uh, that you might want to ask. Um, so you just talk about uh, the civic liberal patriotism yes. that should be advocated right now. Uh, but my question is that I think the current like wave of xenophobia is kind of related to or fueled by uh, the growing economic inequality. So those left behind, who are left behind, uh, feel like the problem is caused by um, those immigrants or, or, or like the um, trade with other nations. So um, my question is that if you think we should advocate this kind of a civic patriotism, should we do something first about uh, the economic inequality? Yes, excellent question, and absolutely we should. Um, so I think that um, uh, in, let me give you just a figure, which is really quite remarkable. In 2014, the median income, median annual pay of top executives in Britain was 4.4 million pounds sterling. The average wage was 26,000 pounds. That's a, a level of inequality we haven't seen for 100 years, and that certainly feeds this. And then what happens is, uh, when you have freedom of movement, when you have a lot of immigration, the populists come along, populist politicians, and say to people, you're much poorer than you were because of the bloody foreigners, because of the immigrants, right? Now, that is not a precisely the cause of it. There are other causes, but it seems plausible to people. So on the one hand, we have to address the real causes of inequality, and on the other hand, we have to show, it goes back to our conversation, that the state is in control of immigration. And this is different from absolute numbers. So let me give you an example. Canada um, has massive immigration, but it absolutely controls and manages its immigration. It's one of the few Western democracies that really has control of who comes across its frontiers. And therefore, people accept large-scale immigration because they know it's under control. So I think that's what we have to do now in Europe, in the European context, both in the national context and in the European context. Because unless you're going to dismantle the whole Schengen area, you've got to do something about the external frontier. That leads to another point, which is if I'm a good liberal and I believe in some basic human equality, what about all those people who are stuck outside the frontiers, which we've now secured? What about the tens of millions of people in Africa, just next to Europe, uh, who are starving and who have living conditions so unworthy of any human being that they will risk their lives on leaky boats to go across the Mediterranean. So a liberal patriotism does something about the causes, manages immigration, but also has to do something about the rest of the world. Can, can I follow up on this? Because that, that is a very useful uh, uh, question because we, we, we should have probably spent a bit more time talking about migration, also internal. Uh, migration. You, you now talk about the importance of protecting Europe's outside uh, borders, but there are serious, including socio-economic problems, that emerge from Europe's commitment to four freedoms, right? The freedom of movement for individuals, so that you have countries like Bulgaria that are virtually being depopulated, where, where one in, in five people have, have, have left, uh, right, over the last... Uh, couple of decades. That causes uh, problems to, to Bulgarian uh, society. So is there, is there a time to even discuss whether that freedom of movement should be somewhat managed or constrained? The Romanian finance minister, not the French finance minister, the Romanian finance minister recently suggested that Romanians working elsewhere in the EU should be limited to a five-year period. 
because he recognized the damage that was being done to Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, you name it, by this extraordinary scale of emigration, uh, mainly to the rest of the EU, um, since they joined, since they joined the, the, the EU. Um, in the Baltic states, it's up somewhere around 27% in one of the Baltic states. I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary. And what is more, it's often the most energetic, the better educated people. Um, and as my friend Ivan Krastev points out, in the past, it was the losers of a revolution who emigrated. It was the French aristocrats after the French Revolution. It was the Russian whites after the Russian Revolution. Here, it's the winners of the revolution, the liberal pro-Europeans who emigrate. So that's a big problem for them. And it's a classic illustration of the one universally true law of history, which is the law of unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, what East Europeans most wanted in European integration. One of the things they most wanted was precisely the freedom of movement. So yes, I think we do need to talk about that. It's quite a difficult conversation to have, but I think we, I, I think we do have to think about that, particularly because it was specifically the scale of freedom of movement, movement of people from Eastern Europe. Something like 2.2 million East Europeans came to Britain mm -hmm. after 2004, which is the biggest single cause of the vote for Brexit. And so it was a, a pity, uh, probably, that uh, David Cameron did not succeed to convince his European counter, uh, counterparts to, to reconsider uh, 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 well, some, some of that. The first thing that was a pity was that w when the European Union was uh, enlarged to the east, most countries imposed a seven-year transition period on freedom of movement from the new member states. Three countries, Ireland, Sweden, and the UK, had no limits, and therefore, obviously, most people came. With benefit of hindsight, that was the original mistake on the part of Tony Blair, to impose no limits. Um, yes, I think you're right. I think, again, with benefit of hindsight, if Germany uh, had conceded something like a so-called emergency break on freedom of movement of people, that might just have swung the referendum the other way. I want to hand over yeah. back to our, our students, so I'm hoping for a couple more questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if I understood correctly, when you were talking about kind of Euro unifying Europe again, that we need some kind of pragmatic um, reforms, do you think that we have like a... Do you think the mentality of both the public and politicians at the time is geared towards these reforms? And if not, how do you think we can kind of change it so that that becomes almost a priority? That's a great question. The answer is, I think, intellectually, some of them see the necessity of reform. Macron would be a classic example of someone who sees the reform. But public opinion, mm. as we've been discussing, is in a very different place. It's not in the mood for, for new great, great new European initiatives. Um, and in particular, Germany is now the central power of Europe. Everything depends on Germany. You know, it's amazing how, if you think about this in historical perspective, where Germany was after 1945, where it was still in 1989, and now every question becomes, what does Germany say about it? And Germany is doing so well, is so prosperous, unlike as, uh, 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 people looking for work, right? I have, sorry, the, 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 the employers looking for, for labor, right? Um, uh, and has done so well out of the Eurozone that there's no sense of urgency about change in Germany. And an irony of Brexit is that if Brexit happens, even more will depend on Germany, even more will be asked of Germany. So my answer to your question is, it's not there yet. Whether we get it depends, if I may say so, on your generation. The generation I call the 89ers, those who were born in or around 1989, roughly speaking, say between 20 and 40 now, because your generation have been the great beneficiaries of this Europe. But if you don't mobilize to defend it, then in 10 or 15 years, it will be crumbling before your eyes. And what do you think we can do to 
head that way, I guess. As as my generation, what do you think we? How do you think we? Can so there's a, there's an initiative which was uh, formed at the LSE called the 89er uh, Initiative, which is an initiative of of 89ers, of people of this generation, um, and essentially. Um, you've got to find, either become the politicians or find the politicians um, uh, or influence the politicians who are going to make the key decisions, right? So that a new generation, I mean, I mentioned Anna Gret Crump Karrenbauer, right? The incentive structure for someone like Anna Gret Crump Karrenbauer, probably future chancellor of Germany, has to be changed. At the moment, the incentive structure is for her to do relatively little. Hence her very cool answer to Macron. If she felt major pressure, right? Now you may say that's not possible, who are we, we're just you know, students or whatever it may be. But look what happened with the Green Movement, yeah? The Green Movement in the 1980s was regarded as way out, eccentric, tiny, extreme. They have totally shifted the agenda in European politics since, so it can be done. Do we have one or two more uh, questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I'm um, thinking about this um, role of parties as agencies between the public and the European Union. So um, what do you think is the relationship of high supporting rates for... High supporting... Rates yeah. for um, Eurosceptic parties right. and um, high levels of public Euroscepticism? So it's another question about public support. I was thinking when you referred to President Macron that it's, it's one of those dysfunctionalities of European politics that uh, people who, who have very little support domestically then reach out to Europe. But the credibility is therefore constrained. Yes. President Macron is not very popular in France. Indeed. And um, he has yet to convince his public that Europe is... Uh, part of the solution and not part of the problem. So if you look at the Eurobarometer surveys and the question, do you think EU membership is a good thing for your country? It's hovering around the 50% mark, some up, some down, a bit up after Brexit, because <laughs> we, have, we have encouraged others to see the good advantages of remaining in the EU. Um, so that, uh, you know, there is this, this, this sort of basic, uh, skepticism, growing skepticism in a broader public about whether the EU is delivering what it promises to deliver. I'm not sure that you can read directly across from that to the support for Viktor Orban or Matteo Salvini or Marine Le Pen or, or other populist parties because, as we were discussing, they are feeding off a set of broader discontents and exploiting those broader discontents to blame it on the bloody foreigners in the form of the immigrant or the people in Brussels and so on. So that I think those are two slightly different phenomenon. Um, I, we will see this May in the European Parliament elections just how much support there is actually for the Eurosceptic parties. Um, my hunch is that they will still only be the third grouping in the European Parliament. I think the biggest will still be the EPP, the European People's Party, then the, Dem the socialist grouping, and then a much larger nationalist populist grouping. So one has to keep that in, has to keep that in proportion. The problem is that they have a clear agenda. They have a clear narrative, a clear story of what's wrong with Europe. We need to stop the immigration, put up the borders, go back to the nation state. And so to speak, my side of the argument does not yet have a clear story to, to tell back. Is there one more question? Somia, do you have a question? Um, maybe we can talk a bit about uh, Ukraine, uh, given uh, recent events in Ukraine. Uh, would you say there is any uh, concrete res responsibility that the EU should have towards um, Europhiles and people that uh, would like to be part of the EU in the periphery 
um, of the current union, given that there is no prospect for uh, enlargement in the next few years, maybe even decades. Uh, is there any specific uh, actions that the EU should take in order to um, help support those that would like to join the EU in future and might be challenged by liberal forces in the neighborhood? So I feel passionately that the answer to your question is yes, because I was a present at the original Orange Revolution in Kiev in 2004-05, and I have never in my life seen such a, 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 a forest of European flags. This was an explicitly pro-European movement uh, in favor of Europe, in favor of European values, uh, and we owe that a response. Moreover, we as Europe have a geostrategic interest long-term in enlargement, it would be a great geostrategic asset for the European Union to have a large country uh, with great economic potential and a young, youthful population uh, in the world of the 21st century. How you do it is, of course, uh, a different question. Um, we've managed to keep some sort of minimal EU unity on sanctions against Putin's Russia. And given the diverse interests within the EU, given the energy dependency of some major EU member states on Russia, that's already an achievement. So keeping up the sanctions, having a Magnitsky law, that kind of pressure I think is very important. Secondly, actually, Angela Merkel, Germany, has been quite good on the diplomacy around Ukraine on talking both to Russia and Ukraine and the US. We have to keep that up. And thirdly, um, contributing to the economic reconstruction of Ukraine. But of course, the difficulty there, as you probably know very well, is the oligarchic system and the level of corruption. So um, there's a certain quid pro quo there. But I think there's a lot that Europe can do and should do. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, it's way off the European agenda. It hardly features on the screen. Could, could I follow up with a very brief question? And, and that will be the last question because we are running out of time. But I'm very glad that Ukraine uh, uh, was brought up because it's an important topic that we haven't discussed, and that is EU's a relationship with Russia and, and the eastern borders. Your, your colleague, uh, Professor Jan Zielonka, coined that term that, that uh, EU doesn't need, uh, shouldn't uh, need hard borders. He, he talks about blurred, blurred boundaries, uh, right? Uh, I'm wondering whether uh, one of the reasons why the EU mismanaged that situation in Ukraine at the time of the second uh, Orange Revolution, the Maidan Maidan. movement, mm and his relationship with Russia was in underestimating the importance of those boundaries in the East and, and basically sending uh, confused, uh, confusing signals, right? On the one hand, yes, uh, we want you Ukrainians. On the other hand, then not standing up uh, against Russia when it came to the need to defend Ukrainians. Crimea is lost. Because the European Union was internally divided on the question of whether it really wanted Ukrainian or not, yeah. right? I mean, that's yes, a sort of of simple course, cause. Of that. Listen, um, one of the things I've learned in 40 years of discussing Europe is never to define a European border, yeah. a, a, a boundary for Europe as such, because Europe doesn't end, it merely fades away. Yeah. It fades away across the vast expanse of Eurasia, somewhere between um, Moscow and Vladivostok, it fades away across Turkey towards Iran, it fades away across the Mediterranean. For the Romans, North Africa, the Maghreb was part of the, the Roman world. It fades away to the West. I've always said Canada is a perfect member state of the EU. It Australia. Culturally, Australia and New Zealand are most welcome <laughs> to join the EU, probably for many Europeans more welcome than some East European countries. The only clear boundary is to the North, because it's the North Pole, right? So in cultural and historical terms, there is no absolutely clear hard boundary. But for a political community, 
for a functioning political and economic community, you have to have clear boundaries. And that was, of course, the great mistake of Schengen, which we haven't talked about enough, the other great European project, which was to knock down your internal frontiers without securing the external frontier. So I think that good fences make good neighbors, but I do believe that commitment to enlargement has to remain part of the EU agenda. And last comment on this, because most successful political communities have some sense of progress, of going somewhere. The United States has managed, sometimes against the evidence, to have this sense for Manifest more destiny. than two centuries. Manifest destiny. People believe in it. Now, the European project had this. It had what I call the nimbus of irreversibility. Uh, but this is now much weakened by the Eurozone crisis, by Brexit, by populism, by what's happened to Schengen. Um, the place it remains strong is in these countries close to the EU, just around the EU, who still believe in Europe, who still want to be part of the project. So we have to hang on to that element of pope, uh, hope and dynamism uh, rather than, you know, draw up the drawbridge. Thank you very much. Please Thank join you. me in thanking Professor Timothy Gatton-Nash.